And welcome everybody to our April coffee chat. Um, we have Leilani with us today and um, she'll be talking about her advisory council in just a little bit. But first we have some things to go through. Um, like I said, we are recording um, and this does go up on our YouTube channel. So if you miss a coffee chat or you'd like to revisit a discussion, you're more than welcome to head over to the uh, YouTube. And then we now have captions available. Uh, that's why I have this slide to remind me <laughs> to turn it on. Uh, live transcript is available if you need it. These are our agreements we go through before each meeting. Um, a few of these are be, be both teachers and learners. We want this to be a safe space um, for everyone to, um, to be able to teach and learn and take space and make space. Um, we use I statements um, and then we be here and present now. We will do a, um, a welcome question, <laughs> check-in question. Um, so let us know your name, where you're calling in from, and are you an early bird or a night owl? Um, so I can start off. My name is Laura Jackson. I'm the director of community at PFCC Partners, and I am currently located up in Eugene, Oregon. And <clears throat> I think more recently, I am a night owl than an early bird, but I do feel like it switches <laughs> every once in a while. Um, we'll go from my list over here. I've got Rosie. Hi, um, I'm Rosie Bartell. I'm located in Chilton, Wisconsin, which is a little community about halfway between Milwaukee and Green Bay. Um, and I am both an early bird and a night owl. <laughs> um, I don't believe in, I always say to, for, for, I say to people, I don't sleep a lot. And, and when I do, I sleep like probably three or four hours a night at the mm -hmm. most. And um, I always, when people ask me about it, I'm like, I figure I'll be able to sleep in heaven. So <laughs> when I get to heaven, I'll, <laughs> I'll sleep. <laughs> and part of it has to do with phantom pains. And, and when I get terrible phantom pains, I ended up getting up and, and just doing something because it's easier to deal with them that way than try to deal with it in, in pain mm -hmm. and, and, and laying there trying to go back to sleep, so. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, Rosie. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Kristen. Ah, I see, can't use camera or mic. I see in the chat. Um, <laughs> work has forced you into early bird practices, yes. <laughs> thank you, Kristen. Um, Maria? I can't hear you. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Montes. I am from the city for a It's my first time here. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Maria. All right. And Michelle. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi. I'm just here to listen and learn. Well, welcome. Welcome. Where are you calling in from? Los Angeles, California. Perfect. Thank you. And then our checking question is, are you a, an early bird or a night owl? <laughs> uh, both. I'm an early bird, and then I choose to be a night owl. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Um, let's see. Stephanie. You're muted if you're talking, Stephanie. <clears throat> I 
might still be working out her her sound there. We'll come back to you. Um, and Libby. Hey everyone, good morning. I was just going off camera because I realized I forgot my coffee, it's downstairs. <laughs> so as soon as I introduce myself, I'm gonna run for my coffee so I don't miss anything. But um, I'm Libby Hoy, I'm the founder and CEO of PFCC Partners and I'm delighted to have our Friday morning, just to relax time to kind of catch up and see how everybody in the network's doing and um, hear what uh, great work Leilani has been up to recently. Leilani is always up to amazing work, so we're eager to hear um, how she's doing. But um, yeah, I am definitely a night owl. And I have tried for most of my 56 years to make myself a morning person, and I have failed, and I have failed, and I have failed. And I continue to fail, but I continue to try. So I don't know what that says, but anyway, night owl, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I have tried being a morning person too, and it doesn't work. <laughs> um, all right. And Stephanie, were you able to get your, your sound working? <clears throat> You're also free to add in the chat um, anything really, but your introductions there. Um, and Leilani, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am right now, I'm in Sacramento, but I live in Reno and I'm on my way to San Francisco. So I stopped at a friend's house this morning so I could chat with you all. Um, nice. I am very much a morning person sounds like I'm the only early bird on this call. So <laughs> I will, I will try to carry the weight for everybody, but, um, I'm really happy to be able to be here and, and talk with all of you and, and hopefully answer any questions and get some, get some of your good ideas. Um, and it's just remarkable to me that there's people from all over the country here gathered together for to, to connect and help each other. So I, I really think there's a lot of power in that. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you coming to our coffee chat today. Um, all right. And before we get started, we do have an engagement opportunity, um, sort of. It's an age-inclusive telehealth innovative practice award. The Center of Excellence for Telehealth and Aging. They're accepting submissions for um, for this award, and it is. I'm going to put the the link to submit um, in the chat, uh, but it highlights programs that show um, excellence with incorporating um, their principles and guidelines um, for telehealth and aging. Um, some of you may have been on, they had uh, West Health had a, a few, a focus group on their, um, their telehealth and aging. And so this is for organizations. So um, if any of you are part of a, an organization that's do, oops, that's doing really good work around telehealth and aging, um, you can take a look at this, um, this award to pass along to your organization. Um, the deadline to submit is May 26th, uh, but there is a $5,000 award. Um, and of course, the an emblem to put in your, their email signatures and press releases and national recognition as um, an awardee. So um, I put the link to submit in the chat. Um, and then we can also follow up follow up with their flyer um, that you can pass along to your organizations. And just one more to um, comment on this one. Mm -hmm. um, many of you know Ting Pun from our PFA network. He's been really involved in this program and setting up these guidelines. So um, he would be a good uh, additional source of information if anybody needs it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Leilani. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, today, I wanna to talk to you about an organization that is housed within the University of Washington. It's called the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement. Um, I know that just rolls right off your tongue really easily. 
Um, our website, hopefully you'll all be interested and we'll look at the website. Um, it's communicationandresolution.org. And um, we are an organization, uh, next slide, Laura, please. We are an organization of patients, families, clinicians, policymakers, and attor attorneys and insurers. And what we're trying to do is normalize a really compassionate response to medical errors. Um, it's, I, I don't know if, if you all are familiar with the term communication and resolution programs. This is CRPs, which is something that is moving slowly through medical systems um, as to create a really honest and systematic approach to working with patients and families after things do not go well in their care. Um, next slide, please. And I'm, I am for the collaborative, um, I'm the president elect. So I will be president, I think starting next month, but currently I am the, the chairperson for the patient and family committee. And there's the collaborative has, uh, several committees. And I, the patient and the family committee, this is kind of our elevator pitch that we've been working on. We are a, we're a pretty new group. I think probably all of you would be considerably more seasoned and experienced than most of us. So we're trying to find our way, uh, figure out how we can be really effective. And so part of that effort is that we have, um, created what we call an elevator pitch. So how can we sort of all get on the same page and talk about what we're trying to do? And so that's what this is, is that we're a group of patients and families. We've all been harmed by care, our medical care, either ourselves or people who we love and care about. And we're trying to educate and I believe it's really important for people to understand why these kind of circumstances impact them, even if they have never stepped a into a hospital a day in their life. I think it's really important that we all are aware of how complex and unfortunately sometimes dangerous healthcare can be. So that's kind of what we are looking to do um, is to really give a voice to injured patients and families because we believe understanding people with these experiences, working with them is really a way to make healthcare safer for everyone. Um, next slide, please. So I came to this work uh, because my son Gabriel, who's in this photo, um, he died at Stanford about 17 years ago after a series of mistakes. So I live in Reno, Nevada. He originally was uh, seen and treated in the hospital there where he was misdiagnosed and uh, given inappropriate medications. And just, I don't need to tell you guys, I'm sure, but a lot of things went poorly. And then he was transferred to Stanford where more things went really poorly. And he, unfortunately, he died at Stanford. And Stanford's response to me was really quite unique. Uh, they explained what happened to me. They apologized. They made a lot of changes based on what they learned from his death. And they, the hospital in Reno refused to talk to me. I have no idea if they uh, made any changes, if they learned. I don't even know if they really even noticed what happened to my son. So I, I know both sides of how, how hospitals can respond to these things and do it in a way that um, can be 
can keep a bad thing from getting so much worse or, and I know what it's like to have things completely ignored. So that's, that is what brought me to this work. And for the past 12 years, I've worked at Stanford um, as a liaison between the hospital's risk management and legal team and patients and families who have had things not go well in their care. So I, I communicate with patients and families as their care is reviewed. I understand or I try to understand their experiences so that we can answer their questions. And then um, I stay connected with them all the way through explaining to what, what happened to them and then uh, possibly moving towards compensation and settlements if, if we get to that point. Um, so that's a little bit about me and kind of my motivation and history and why I feel so passionate about this work. Um, next slide, please, Laura. So this is something that I think about a lot of how can we best help patients and families after things go poorly, um, after mistakes, or after things go poorly that could not have been prevented, just after bad things happen in their healthcare. And I really believe that one of the things that's going to be best for us is to prepare people before they need this help. So that's kind of what I, I, I'm really um, looking forward to understanding and hearing some of your thoughts about what you think could help patients and families. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. And so the, the patient and family um, committee as part of the collaborative, we're, we're really pretty small. I think there's about 10 of us. Um, we're looking for more members. Uh, we're looking for ideas. Uh, we're looking for co-conspirators. <laughs> you know, people to help us with the revolution that I think we, that I really want to see. And so I, I'm hoping that some of you would be interested and I, I'd like to just open it up for a discussion. These, this is all the slides that I have. Um, if we, if I can answer any questions or if you can give me feedback about how you think we could spread the word of why it's important to understand these things before they happen. And I'm I'm also I'm going to put my my email I should have included my email in this, but I'm going to put my email in the chat so that in the future if anybody wants to um connect with me, I'd be happy to talk to you. And I I'll include my phone number in here too. Thank you, Leilani. Does anybody have Okay, any? all you night owls, I'm ready for your good <laughs> ideas now. Bring them on. Shall we go back? I'll go back to the question here. So mm -hmm. I have a couple questions about the committee itself, Leilani. Yep. Um, such important work that that you're doing and continue to lead. Um, in terms of the committee, can you give us some of the logistics of it? Like, um, how often do you meet? Do you have a charter? What is sort of the North Star of the committee? How do they interact with the rest of the work? Some of those kinds of kind of logistics stuff. Yeah, so Libby, these are really great questions. And frankly, a lot of it is to be determined. Um, oh, okay. This is really quite a new group, a new organization. It's been very organic, kind of, hey, you, hey, you, let's get together and not strategic, which I really okay. want to shift. So right now we meet for an hour every other month. There's a little bit that of emailing that goes back and forth in between, uh, but we don't tell everyone, but I don't really think we know what we're doing, quite mm. honestly. Um, we have Armando, who's, who's part of our group. So mm -hmm. he's really, really helpful, but we don't really know what we're trying to accomplish and how to do it, which in one way we can say, oh, well, that's just messy. But I feel like it's a really big opportunity to get really clear and to start 
to start to really move this work forward in a a way that focuses on the patients and families that are involved in this. Um, I'll tell you that I will be, as the incoming president, I will be the first president who's not either an attorney or a physician who's the president of this board, uh, which I'm I'm very honored by this and um, feel, feel like it's a really big opportunity to raise our voices because I think we're not gonna make a whole lot of progress until patients and families start demanding transparency and compassion after these things happen. Like getting the attorneys to wanna do it and getting physicians to wanna do it, we need them, no doubt about it, but it's, the, it's patients and families normalizing this and expecting it is what's really going to move this forward. And so that's why I'm looking for more engagement and just more ideas of how we would do this. So, I mean, last week when we woke, when we spoke Libby, we just worked on that elevator pitch because I, I don't feel like we all even agree on what we're trying to do. And um. We don't, I don't think we really have enough, enough people. We need, we need more mass. We need more participation. We need more ideas. And so that's. I really appreciate that candor, Leilani. I think that that's, as you said, a big opportunity. You're just getting started. And so coming to a group like this, um, who I, I see Rosie's hands up and she's got so much experience. Um, so I think that you know, helping to shape that is, is a great opportunity. I think, um, you know, our approach to setting up uh, patient family partnership programs is really built in that infrastructure. So I'm happy to provide, you know, um, resources, guidance, whatever that might be, but I'm going to shut up and let Rosie talk. Well, I, I guess, Libby, I was going to say pretty much what you just said was that, you know, um, first of all, I'm going to offer my help. Great. Um, because I, um, and and I because I I believe that um, you have opportunities, but what when you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know you know, and and it's not just patients that don't know what they don't know, but also probably physicians and insurers and and attorneys don't always know what they don't know, and so they don't you know they don't understand. And so it's not us and them against each other, but it's how do we work together? How do we come up with a plan to create um, a way that we can inform patients and families of, of situations? And how can we also inform the hospital and look at where, where there's glitches, where there's gaps, where there's opportunities to improve the quality of care? Um, you know, like I always, you know, if, if I hadn't been invited, by the hospital that I had um, my knee replacement done and got the infection. And I had, hadn't been invited by them to look at why they were having so many MRSA staff infections. I'm not sure I'd be doing the work today, mm. but they invited me to the table and they, it was, it was co-designed long before they ever talked about co-design. That word wasn't even in the world yet, but they, you know, that I was the first patient they ever invited to the table. And, and by me learning about the background and the structure and how things happen in operating rooms, I very quickly, you know, help them look at why things could have went wrong. And, you know, what, you know, because what a patient believes happens and what really happens is worlds apart. And, and, and not, and, and I always, my theory is that patients need to have the knowledge of knowing what it really goes on in hospitals and 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 what you know that it's not just that physician that's doing the surgery that's responsible or even the nurses in that room but it's facilities and it's environmental services and it's all those people have a responsibility to provide the best care possible and they all provide care for that for you not just that doctor who's doing your surgery and so I you know, I, I, I work in sometimes strange ways, but I, um, so 
I um, keep you know wanting to help others look at ways of helping, you know, putting together the structure and then moving it forward. So Rosie, I'm going to nominate you to take my job as the chairperson of the committee because no, I no, 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 totally no. I agree with that. everything you said. <laughs> um, I really, a couple things that I really want to call out that I appreciate so much is um, you're right. People don't know what they don't know. And we don't know, like patients and families, like you said, we, I think most of us until we're in the thick of this work have no idea how complex it is. And then right. we're shocked when it doesn't work perfectly, right? right. Um, I also don't, I think that the isolation and the silos sometimes can really cause, Right. It, we, we are not making progress if we demonize people and say, they're the problem, let's blame them. Like that, we get absolutely Doesn't work. Doesn't work. No. And th that's where collaborating and just being really curious I think can get us so far. And I also, it also really resonates that I, I find and get frustrated by this, this kind of, well, things should be, it should be like this and it should be, and they should listen to us and they should do this. And I don't think that saying should gets us very far at all. I think if we can level set and understand where people are coming from and live in the reality of the complexity, that is where we're really gonna get things done. So um, I really appreciate those, those thoughts, Rosie. And I'm so glad that the hospital invited you in, not just because Clearly, you're so valuable to them, but I would also imagine that it is really significant for you to be able to participate in this work. I think that's something that sort of gets missed is how important it is for us to find meaning from these really difficult things that happen to us. So I, I really appreciate and, it. And I think that, you know, using the patient's stories and, and using them to drive improvement is, is key, is key to, um, to everything, to the work. And so, and I, you know, Libby's question about a charter and, 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 you know, is, I think you've got a good start by having that stream of thought and at least, um, uh, you know, some thoughts about what you, what you, Will, you know, think you're what you believe is you're about, but I think having a charter and and moving things forward is key to a lot of things at this point. And then from there, um, really becoming, you know, patients and 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 families working with healthcare providers and you know uh, attorneys, insurers. I mean. I was intrigued because it's hard to get insurers at the table. So mm -hmm. you've, you've got somebody at the table that we haven't had. I don't I haven't seen a lot at the table. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in, in, in just in that way. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, referring to insurance, where, where I work at Stanford, I'm housed within the insurance company that covers the, covers the, um, the physicians and the okay okay and you know i'll hear i'll he'll hear people say well they're just doing it they're just doing this approach because it saves them money and i guess my response is as long as we are talking to patients and families i don't care what the motivation is like i would want i would love it for everybody to do it out of the kindness of their heart but I'm not that naive. And so this approach of, of explaining and being honest with people after bad things happen, it saves a lot of money. And so um, that is starting to move a little bit more in the direction of having the insurance companies embrace this approach. Um, and that's, that's good and important. 
but they're not doing it because it is ne necessarily patient and family centered care. They're doing it because it saves their bottom line. And okay, I'll play that game if I have to. It's as long as but eventually they're going to find out that family centered care is valuable. Agreed. Absolutely. I 100% agree and know that that's true. But for right now, I will I will take any open door I can possibly bang down, I guess, is what right. is what I'm saying. And and you know, we can't, I don't feel like I can influence people's motivations. How they how they get to that is is their own way as long as they get to the end. That's how I feel about it. Thank you. It looks like Libby put in the chat um, saying that many, many really good people work in really bad systems. So that's a good, a good point. <clears throat> Does anyone um, else? Oh, go, go ahead, Libby. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that my my son died at Stanford because a nurse uh, turned off the sound on the alarms next to his bed. And probably all of you know what that racket is like. And we were both so tired and we just wanted to go to sleep. And so she thought that she had turned the sound off just next to his bed, but she had turned them off everywhere on her pager at the nurse's station. And so when his heart stopped beating, there was nothing told us about that. But now, now I know that she asked to have him moved that night. They said no to her. She was taking care of another profoundly very sick child at the other end of the, the, the ward. And so she was running back and forth. So I... I see the system problems and how she was absolutely a victim of this terrible circumstance as well. And it has radically changed her life. Um, and I, I'm quite, I know a little bit about her and I feel very protective of her, but she, she really, um, the hospital's response to after this happened was not kind to her at all. And um, I wish it had been, but so just just bringing that up as a response to Libby's point that there, there are really good people who work in systems that are not set up for anybody to thrive is, is a, um, it's a threat to all of us that they have to do that. Libby, I saw you did come off mute. If yeah, I was just um, um, thinking again about um, sort of the purpose and the drive and sort of who will this committee inform and what direction mm -hmm. and um, I love the elevator speech and I think, you know, creating that into a North star for this group so that everybody coming in understands what they're coming into. Mm -hmm. And, um, maybe you start with a smaller group of a few to start to get some of those pieces together. And then, um, what we always do, Leilani is to, um, keep that super flexible. So come up with something. It's always easier to respond to something than it is to develop, you know, start from scratch. And so um, we just leave that, you know, even the the vision and the the charter open ended a little bit for mm -hmm. um, for the first six months just to make sure it fits, make sure it's really saying what we want to say, make sure that people coming in and joining your coalition um, have you know clarity on what it is that you're trying to achieve, like what a success to you, how is that defined, and mm -hmm. if this coalition was successful. XYZ would be in place or XYZ would happen. So um, I think those kinds of um, questions and sketching out some thoughts is a great place to start. And then just getting, you know, groups or people or uh, meeting up with Rosie and asking her what she, what this says to her or 
Um, anyone else in the PFA network? You know, I, I think that would maybe be a, a helpful process for you just to um, kind of get some of that clarity in process. It's such, it's so hard. It's like point, point A, where do we put our finger, put our finger, toe in the sand and start from there. So right. I, I've tried that to be 100% collaborative and co-design from the get-go and have just found right. it's really hard if people don't know what they're co-designing at all, you know, and, and I would say that we have developed many a vision statement and North Star that ended up completely different in three months than it started out. And that, but it was, it was, you know, putting something in the environment for people to respond to um, was really helpful. And then that the other question that I had is, are you seeking, um, I think, I think I know the answer, but um, seeking folks who have experienced harm and, or cared for someone who has, um, as opposed to others who maybe haven't experienced harm, but are deeply concerned about patient safety. So I'm going to go, I, there's three things I want to talk about. <laughs> Sorry, so, I just uh, verbally no, threw no, up no, on no, you. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I really like the idea of kind of reverse engineering of thinking what would success be and going backwards to that. I really, really like that. Um, also, we just going back to kind of the structure of the collaborative, this committee that I am on reports up to the board and the board is, I don't know, there might be 12 or 14 of us all from all around the country. And it's, it's a pretty heavy hitting board. We have uh, a woman who is um, directly reporting to President Biden about patient safety issues. We have uh, Alan Kachaya, who's the head of patient safety at, um, what's the big, Hopkins. Um, I, could, I could go down a big list, but there, it's heavy hitters on this, on the board. Um, and so we, we our, our committee is to, uh, keep patients and families at the center of our work. And I pushed back on our committee and I said, what does that mean? And it's radio silence. So to your point of like, we, let's find our North Star, but maybe the North Star is actually in the South and we just don't know that yet. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just being a little more kind to myself in this of recognizing how difficult this work is. And especially when you're starting from the, from scratch, which Libby, I know I do not need to tell you how hard it is. <laughs> I'm just kind of starting to, to be, to recognize that in a, in kind of an honest way. So um, we are looking for patients and families to join us on, in this work. Um, I think I have the committee more open to the idea of not having it as a requirement that people have been injured. Um, I really believe that there are people who can help us in this work who have not had that, have not had a bad thing happen to them. And so we, we are open to anyone. Um, I frankly would like to have people who are really familiar with how healthcare works to join our committee. I think we're moving in that direction. I think it would be great to have people who know a lot about communications and policy. Like, frankly, I wanna spread the word far and wide. And so people who know how to do that, I'd be really interested in having. Like, uh, not just, this is not just a group to sit around and talk about their own experiences. Like that's, that's another thing that is, is really hard. Um, I think, and I may get some pushback on this and I'm really open to it, um, is I think to be really effective in this work is we have to understand that our own personal experience is not that unique. Like I wish, I wish kids were not dying in hospitals because of errors every day, but I know that it is absolutely happening and yeah. I can't go back and bring Gabriel back, but I can learn from that 
and hopefully protect other kids and families. And right. that's, I think, I think if I had to really zero in on my motivation, that's going to be my motivation. So, and, and that's an excellent motivation yeah. because I, you know, it's, it's not about me and it's not about, you know, but, but it's about using your knowledge and, and what you've gained by, because of the situation and using that knowledge to make sure this doesn't happen to somebody else. Yeah. And that was, that's been my motivation from day one. And um, this, you know, this happened in 2009. So in August of 2009. So I've been, I've been at this work for a while and, yeah. and if somebody would have told me I was going to still be doing it 14 years later. I would have said, no, after 14 years, they're not going to want to use my story or they don't, my story and my knowledge isn't going to be that valuable. But um, I've learned a lot because the more you're hospitalized, the more you've dealt with, deal with things, the more you learn. And, and, and I, you know, and I, you, you're right about the silos. You're right about, you, you definitely are right about a lot of things that have to, you know, we have to address in order to make this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rosie, I, I appreciate you, your tenacity in this. And I, I've said to people, I think, I think resilience is the one trait that it, you absolutely have to have. Um, you know, my, I got involved in this work about, I don't know, about 12 years ago. And I, I can't believe I'm still talking about this right? Like really, yeah. how many more times do I have to talk about this? Um, and that, even that is a hard thing to kind of come to terms with of like, okay, how many, how many kids need are going to die before we really make a change? Right. Um, and unfortunately the answer is a lot. And, but I, but, I you know, um, I always say, I don't want ever anybody to feel sorry for me it's not, it's not as, my story isn't a sad story. My story is a story that needs to be told so that we can move forward and, and change, make changes. And so, um, you know, and you may get pushback because pa patient groups many times, especially when they're mainly, um, they all come with their own agendas. And, and, and especially when they have all dealt with harm. And that's why you might need some key players in the group who I have either moved beyond the harm and, and can, you know, or pick players who um, haven't had the harm, but are care about patient safety mm -hmm. and really care about this, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. this issue. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a hard, it's, it's, that's a hard thing as well to say, okay, we're not going to talk about our personal experiences here. We're going to look about at the bigger picture. Like, I'm never going to say that to anybody. I'm no, just no, not. no. Uh, but you can move it. Right, right, right. I, 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 another thing I, I think about is how, like, for me, I, I never wanted to know about all this stuff, you know, like what, a, what, a, it's, I did not want this to be my career right? Like we are in it because we have seen something and we cannot look away. And right. there's a lot of power in that too, but also a lot of loss that this is, this is what, this is the space. This is what takes up space in our brains now where it this might, is why I can't, nice. this is why I don't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It turns us um, into night owls. Right. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a morning person and a night owl, but, um, I, I, I think that, you know, you, the, you can move a group forward by having, um, you know, by, by bringing things to them, you know, by bringing, you know, it, we don't ever want it, the stories will help drive, you know, the stories are the data we need to drive um, the drive the visions and, and the drive, you know, but you can't stop with the story. It has to move it forward. And, and how do we fix it? How do we, how do we make this never happen again? You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, you know, that's why 
you tell the story because you don't want it to happen to someone else. That's why you tell your son's story. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I my heart broke when I heard, you know, what happened because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, that nurse didn't set out to make a mistake. Oh, I no. say this all the time. Nobody got up on August 17th of 2009 and said, today I'm gonna to give somebody MRSA. That didn't happen, but yet it, something went wrong that day. Mm -hmm. Something went wrong in, either in the surgery or in my room or somewhere, somewhere something didn't happen right. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, you know, I'm an amputee and I'm an amputee all the way to my waist on my right side. And, um, and you know, it's, it, it's, it's not about that happening, it's about the fact that I don't want this to happen to somebody else. And, and it, there are reasons and ways to make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else. Well, I think I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that happen to you. And for me to not make improvements based on what we learned from my son's death, that makes it profoundly worse. Right, right. Because it, it, it devalues, it devalues him. It devalues what could have been. And that's, that's where, like, I think that might be what really connects with people who aren't super familiar with this work. Um, that, that could work. I think like that, I think that connects with people of, of getting people to recognize the value of an individual and how easily this could happen to anyone. That's the other thing that I think matters is this could happen to any of us at any time. Yeah. <clears throat> Definitely. Um, before we have about 10 more minutes, um, if anybody else has any thoughts, Michelle, curious if, if you had any other questions or, or thoughts around this. You're muted. Can I pose another question? Sure. Um, what? So in in my conversations, just with like friends and families who I call civilians, you know, who, people who have not really been involved in this work, who are out living their lives, doing other things, not connected to healthcare. When I talk to them about this, they're they're astonished. It's it's like unbelievable to people to learn that medical errors is the third leading cause of death in this country, right? Like it, it's astonishing to people. And I, I think that if more people knew this, there would be more action to change it. Um, and then I, I'll get a little bit of pushback of, oh, well, that's so terrifying no one would no one would want to no one really wants to know that which i just i don't think that that's true but i i i'd be curious of other if other people find that same situation anyone have any thoughts <clears throat> around that question. Stephanie, I don't know if you got your, your mic working again. It looked like Kristen keeps off. I got disconnected. I'm sorry. That's okay, Rosie. You know, um, Leilani, I think that patient safety has, while we, you know, definitely experienced a backslide during um, COVID and the pandemic and everything that, and and not only just a backslide in, you know, rates of infection and rates of, of harm, but we also just 
put it on the back burner for like three years, which is really a tough place to, to be thinking about and coming out of. Um, but I guess what I've seen over the last maybe six to 12 months in conversations with people, um, and I, I would say, I, I will clarify, people within the PFA network, so people with lived experience, maybe not with harm, but with lived experience, I think that patient safety is a really big priority for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think that there, um, I, I hear concerns around patient safety and harm um, where medical errors are concerned, where infection rates are, are building, where um, sepsis is again it's, out of control, right. where uh, readmissions are, are causing people um, devastating side effects. And so I hear about it in those lanes. I also hear about it um, from the, the uh, perspective of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And right. I hear about patient safety being a very big concern for black and brown communities um, due to disparities that we you know, now thankfully are more aware of. I think we should have always been aware of, but for myself, it's been a journey. And so I'm uh, you know, appreciative of the fact that patient safety is a huge concern for our black and brown and um, particularly non-English speakers. So. I think that there's a concept of this um, greater concern for patient safety. I don't know that we are always as um, productive about sort of channeling people's energy around patient safety into um, effective groups and effective um, programs where they can really be seen. So um, there's a lot of DEI work going on, including in our own organization. Um, so I think folks who are really passionate about that angle of patient safety, um, there's a lot of good work going on in the HQIC and the 314 hospitals working on sepsis and in, uh, hospital acquired infections and that group. So there's that avenue. Um, what we haven't talked about is what you're bringing to us today a little bit more, which is when medical error occurs, how do we manage for both in what I heard you say in your own narrative was for both, um, the, the person and the family who experiences the harm, but also the care team who mm -hmm. experiences the harm. And so mm -hmm. this is sort of a new door to patient safety, if you will. So um, I think that, you know, kind of continuing to share forward, at least in our network, um, the opportunity to, to uh, be able to express that, I think would be really, um, really productive in that, folks who have experienced that particular circumstance um, and have, or or haven't, but are concerned about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. your missus and everybody else that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, this would be another avenue for that patient safety passion to come forward. Does that make sense? Oh, completely makes sense. And, and there, it is a, it is a straight bold line between people feeling comfortable of coming forward and talking about errors and the ability to learn from them and prevent them from happening again, which that's right. psychological safety, right? And when you don't have psychological safety, people do not come forward and then more injuries happen. Like that is, right. that's an ABC one, two, three, a cause and effect that happens. So you know, that even that idea of really focusing in on how this is a patient safety issue, not like a litigation issue, even that is sort of a new idea. Um, it shouldn't be, but it it is um, particularly amid um, like attorneys who have a profound influence over this approach. Every hospital has a group of attorneys who are really involved in that decision making, and they tend to be quite far removed from any patient safety kind of efforts, which goes back to the silo stuff. And Rosie, I see you shaking your head, um, but it, it that is that is just the way that it is, uh, where I'm in a state where the litigation for a medical error is only 25,000. What state is that? Are you in Virginia? Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. Yeah, it's appalling. It's appalling. And so wow. 
to, to, to even think about litigation is, is, you know, is, first of all, it was never a thought in my mind. Um, yeah. I just, it wasn't something I, that's not who I am. And so yeah. it was never a thought in my mind, but, um, but yet, you know, litigation is not an avenue that many people use in this state. And mm -hmm. so the focus often does not fall in that area. And, and, um, yeah. Yeah, I but, see that. And, and that's and that's because, you know, this bar was set so low, um, probably 10 years or 15 years ago. And, um, and it, many medical errors, it's almost impossible to prove anything within a reasonable doubt. And I and like I said, I just don't believe we always look at it from both sides. And and we need to look at it from both sides. We need to look, and you know, part of the reason there's more medical errors happening now than that than before COVID is because we have such a reduction in staff, mm -hmm. and people are stretched so thin, mm -hmm. and 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 they're being asked to do more and more, and 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 basically, there's lots of things happening today. I mean, I. I talk to CEOs who say, I'm so sick of having to apologize to family mm -hmm. because of medical errors. I, yeah. I don't know what to do anymore. I need to fix this. I need to figure out how to not have medical errors happen every day in my hospital. And that's where CEOs are these days. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're dealing with it every single day because they're happening because they don't have enough staff. And, and and staff isn't as committed as they were before COVID, and they're not, you know, they're just they're they're looking for for different avenues of work even. And yeah, it's we have a lot of we have a lot of work to do. And and then you know on the other side of it, patients aren't trusting, and so they're dealing with a lot of. Um, incivility from patients patients are not as nice as they used to be you know um, mm -hmm. many patients are you know lash out the minute something goes wrong or something isn't quite right or or they aren't you know seen on this immediately or i mean there's a lot of i mean i i don't like to when i have to say the word incivility in the same sentence as healthcare and patient mm -hmm. safety it 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 just um, bothers me, but yet that's what is happening in this world. Yeah, I agree with you, Rosie. Um, Laura, could you give um, uh, Leanna, Leanna my, um, my email so that we can communicate? Sure. I, that would Absolutely. be fantastic. Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay. We'll be happy to connect you both. Okay. Well, we are just past the top of the hour, so thank you. I feel you like everybody. I've taken up this meeting, and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Thank I definitely didn't morning. pass the mic enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate um, you, Leilani, for coming to the PFA Network um, and um, to the coffee chat today. Uh, just a reminder that we have our conference on May 2nd coming up very, very soon. Registration is open. You can check that out at pfccpartners.com. Uh, we also have our patient community open house on May 1st. Uh, so the day before, same place, the California Endowment Center. Um, and you can stop by anytime from 2 to 4.30 and uh, learn more about the, net, the network and what we're doing and um, connect with other patient, um, patient family partners who are attending the conference and in the um, LA area. So even if you're not attending the conference, but you're in uh, LA, on May 1st, you are more than welcome to join us on at the open house. Thank you, everyone. This was really helpful for me. I'm glad to connect with all of you. Thank you so much, Leilani. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Leilani. Everybody. Yes. Have a great weekend. Bye. Have a great weekend.